As we exited 2013, a tier zero menace was raging on. With the last two YCSs of the year, we saw Dragon Rulers absolutely take over for a second time that year, with the main culprit this time being that of Six Sense, which allowed you to completely set up off its activation regardless of the roll's result. With such an oppressive card causing a tier zero reign for Dragon Rulers right at the end of the year, a ban list would be put in place on January 1st, 2014, and knowing that, the hit shouldn't be surprising. Newly banned were Dragon Ravine, Return from the Different Dimension, and Sixth Sense, all hits at Dragon Ruler, as well as Self-Destruct Button, a card that simply had caused too many headaches for tournament play to remain legal. Newly limited were all four Dragon Rulers, Debris Dragon, and Sacred Sword of Seven Stars, as hits to Dragon Ruler. Divine Wind of the Mist Valley in response to a couple of FDK brews that were popping up using Harpy Dancer. Final Countdown as a hit to the popular stall deck, Spellbook of Fate as a hit to Spellbook's remaining best card, and Magician of Faith returning from the banned section to one copy. Newly semi-limited were Chaos Sorcerer and Lone Fire Blossom, both coming back from Limited. Lastly, newly unlimited were Arclord Christia, Constellar Ptolemy M7, Mizuki, Plague Spreader Zombie, TG Striker, Tour Guide from the Underworld, and Fire Formation Tenki, being a wave of cleanup from when the OCG and TCG lists were linked. Overall, this ban list did one thing major, which was killing the tier 0 version of Dragon Rulers, knocking out a majority of the heavy hitters from the deck as well as cracking down on some of the more toxic cards for events like Countdown and Self-Destruct Button. In addition to this, the Zexal Mangas Volume 4 would release a week later, bringing number 47 Nightmare Shark, a direct attacking rank 3 option that would see niche play for now, but became a lot more relevant later in the year as a game closer. As the first event of the year, YCS Sydney would take place on January 19th, and would ring in the year with no Dragon Ruler decks appearing in the top cut known lists, a first from the previous half a year. The field here had devolved a bit back to the tendencies of the pre-Dragon Ruler era, with Fire Fist being the standout deck of the event, although no Notably, when I say Fire Fist, I primarily mean a Beast Warrior control pile with Fire Fist Bear at the center, so take that with a grain of salt. Anders Co. would take the event on Teleport Karakuri, being a surprise run for the deck to take in the newly weakened metagame, but the meta would soon solidify around its big threats in Fire Fist and Mermail once again as it had in pre-Tachyon formats. This led us into the first core set of the year, and with the meta in a newly reset position, any new strategy with enough support could easily take the spot of the new top deck. Legacy of the Valiant. Release date, January 24th, 2014. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Sylvan, Ghost Trick, Vujin. Impact, a clear push, but not a breakthrough. Legacy of the Valiant would be the first core set of the year, and with it would come both a new archetype as well as a wave of support for two archetypes from the tail end of 2013 to try and change something about their position in the metagame. The new archetype was Sylvan, a series of plant monsters that also brought with them a new keyword to the game in the form of Excavate, in which you reveal a set number of cards from the top of your deck to do an effect. Many previous cards that did this, such as Pot of Duality, would also be eroded in the coming months to reflect this change. As for Sylvans, each of the main deck monsters had two effects, one that lets you excavate a certain number of cards and send plants you find to the graveyard, putting the rest back on bottom of the deck, and the other triggering when excavated and sent to grave. These included Peacekeeper, who could excavate one on summon and revive a level 4 lower plant if excavated, Kuma Shurmo, who excavated up to 5 on being flipped and pops a spell trap when excavated, Marshall Leaf, who excavates up to 2 on normal and pops a monster if excavated, Hermitry, who can excavate 1 once per turn and can rearrange the top 3 of your deck when excavated, I'll say, a rank 8 that can declare a card name once per turn to excavate and either add it to hand if called correctly or send it to the grave if not, and can detach one when a card is sent from deck to grave by card effect to put a card on field on either the top or bottom of the deck, and their field spell Mount Sylvania, which can send a plant from hand or field to grave to stack a sylvan card from deck on top of the deck, and during the opponent's end phase, can excavate one like the sylvan monster effects. This archetype had a lot of good bones to it, but the issue primarily lied in that all of their consistent lines required access to Hermitry, who was level 8. This could be offset slightly thanks to the recent semi-limit of Lone Fire Blossom, but general plant support could only take the strategy so far for now. Ghost Trick would receive a new wave of support here in Jack Frost, who can summon itself when the opponent attacks you directly, flipping the attacking monster face down, Mary, who can be discarded when you take damage to summon a Ghost Trick from deck face down, Dulahan, a rank 1 that gains attack for each ghost trick you control and can detach one on either player's turn to have a monster's attack that turn, able to cycle a ghost trick when sent to grave, and Museum, 
A field spell that prevents set monsters from being attacked, lets monsters attack directly if all opposing monsters are set, and flips any monster that deals battle damage face down. Ghost Trick would continue to see no standalone success, but this wave would bring enough useful stall pieces to the archetype that it would see some consideration as a splash engine into other decks that needed more stall and swarm tools, like Monarch. Bujin would receive another wave here in Arasuda, a beast warrior Bujin that can summon itself when a Bujin is banished from field or grave, and can draw one and discard one if a Bujin was added from deck to hand that turn. Peacock, who can send itself from hand to grave in main phase 2 to search a Bujin. Hare, who can banish itself from grave on either player's turn to protect the Bujin from destruction once that turn. And Tsukiyomi, a light locked rank 4 that can detach one to send your hand to the grave to draw two cards, and can summon Beast Warrior Bujins from grave up to the number of materials it had when removed by the opponent's card effect. Bujin, already being in a decent position following the January 1st ban list, would take the support and run with it to be a solid potential strategy in the upcoming metagame, and this support did a lot to reinforce that. Moving into notable standouts, Kalantosa would be a very notable inclusion for the level 2 Earth Beast strategy, able to pop a card on field when summoned by a beast effect. This would also be complemented by Obedience Schooled, able to summon 3 level 2 or lower beasts from deck with their effects negated, being an excellent starter for that strategy too. Tackle Crusader could, when sent to grave, flip a monster face down or bounce a spell trap the opponent controls to hand, being a solid piece in rock decks moving forward. In the same vein, Gorgonic Guardian is a rock-locked rank 3 that can, on either player's turn, detach to drop an opponent's monster's attack to zero and negate its effects that turn, also able to, on your turn only, destroy a monster with zero attack. While incredibly powerful, the rank 3 rock restriction was just a bit too much at the time for the card to see play, but it would see rogue level experimentation in later 2016 with another archetype getting legacy support. The generic extra deck pool itself would see a bunch of new additions here that would shape the meta moving forward, such as number 101 Silent Honor Arc, a generic rank 4 that can detach two materials to suck up an opponent's special summoned attack position monster as material, bringing one of the best removal tools to the rank 4 pool. I say one of because released alongside Arc was Evil Swarm Exiton Knight, a generic rank 4 that could, once per chain in your main phase or the opponent's battle phase, if the total number of cards your opponent has on field and in hand is more than than you, nuke the field except for itself, being one of the best rank 4s due to either being a setup breaker or providing a layer of protection going into the opponent's turn, demanding a removal prior to the battle phase. Lastly for the exceed pool would be Downard Magician, a spellcaster locked rank 4 that could also be overlaid onto any rank 3 in the main phase 2, giving 200 for each material and dealing piercing damage, being a solid option for rank 3 decks to convert their used exceed monsters. In addition to the Exceed Pool additions, the generic Synchro Pool would also receive Leo Keeper of the Sacred Tree, a level 10 Synchro that cannot be targeted by card effects except in your main phase 2, becoming the premier level 10 generic Synchro overnight. Rank Up Magic Astral Force is a spell that can target an Exceed to overlay another Exceed onto that is the same type and attribute but two ranks higher, and can be added from grave to hand instead of conducting your normal draw for turn. Not seeing any play now, but would find an incredibly interesting niche in the coming months. Shared Ride lets you draw a card every time the opponent adds a card from deck or grave to hand except by drawing, being a searcher equivalent to Max C, seeing side deck play in certain formats where searchers are extremely heavily played. Lastly, Skill Prisoner can target a monster you control to negate any monster effect that targets it that turn, able to be banished from grave to do it again, seeing niche use against certain strategies. YCS Atlanta would be held a week later on February 2nd, and this event would be the first of many this year that would be what we're going to refer to as half-sealed events. For context, this year specifically, we'd see almost every YCS that took place in North America run a standard constructed event until Top 16, at which point all players would swap to doing a draft event using whatever the current battle pack was, being War of the Giants for this event. This meant that the Top 32 would still be indicative of what decks were performing the best in the meta, but it doesn't mean that the deck that won the event would be the best deck of the event, rather what the winner used to reach Top 16. With all of that preamble out of the way, Fire Fist, or more specifically the Bear deck as Konami's official coverage refers to it, would continue to take the lion's share of the top cut, even being piloted by Christian Jorge, who would take first place here after the Top 16 draft. Girgia was the other very notable standout here, rising into a dominant position with the discovery of Girgia gear being able to swarm with the Girgiano pieces, standardly being mixed in with Car Curry tuners for synchro access. Heratic would crack into the top cut with multiple showings here, 
though notably was the Heratic Ruler variant in all cases. The Dragon Rulers had found their next core to latch onto and ride into meta viability, though this time was notably less powerful due to only having one of each ruler at their disposal, relying more heavily on the Heratic side of the deck to do the heavy lifting and swarming. This would lead into the year's first structure deck a week later, which would itself set the trend that this year of structure decks is going to be exclusively focused on bringing new support to previously introduced archetypes, starting with a GX era staple. Cyber Dragon Revolution, release date February 7th, 2014, set type structure deck, major strategies Cyber Dragon. Impact, a couple of specifically useful cards. Cyber Dragon Revolution was the first of three structure decks this year aimed at taking a meta strategy, or in this case a singular card, and making a full modern strategy out of it. In the case of Cyber Dragon, the idea was to make swarming with them far easier to enable exceed plays. Their new cards here included Core, who's considered Sidra on field and engrave, search to cyber spell trap on normal, and could, if your opponent controls a monster and you don't, banish itself from grave to summon a cyber dragon monster from the deck. Dry, who's considered Sidra on field and engrave, level modulates all Sidras to 5 on normal, and if banished, protects the Sidra from being destroyed that turn. Nova, a rank 5 machine locked exceed that could detach to summon a Sidra from grave, can banish a Sidra from hand or field to boost itself by 2100 that turn, and floats into a machine fusion on effect destruction by the opponent, and repair plant, which can use one effect if you have a Sidra in grave or both if you have three or more, being to search a light machine or shuffle back a light machine into deck from grave. While this didn't turn Cyber Dragon into its own viable standalone strategy for the meta, it did do a couple of interesting things. The first was core. As by being a Cyber Dragon that you could normal summon and ducks under bottomless, it became a side deck option to use against machine decks to make Chimera Tech Fortress Dragon without risking tripping back row. The second was Nova. As while it wouldn't be played at all for the time being, Nova was one of those cards that would be broken wide open in early 2016 for reasons out of its control, but we'll get to those soon enough. Reprints here included Sidra, Cyber Valley, Super Poly, MST, Trap Stun, and Deprison to name a few. YCS Berlin would be held two weeks later, and from the results here, the Bear Deck and Mermail would split the main portion of the representation, with Alpay Engine taking first place using a trap-heavy Reckless Greed build of Mermail. YCS Sao Paulo would be held two weeks later, and while this event was also a half-draft event, the draft would be everything before Top 16, so the decks listed here did not necessarily earn a spot in the top cut by the deck's merits, so take the top cut here with a grain of salt. Carlos Araujo would take the event on Harpy, able to take down four rounds in a row in the slimmed down matchup spread. YCS Chicago would be two weeks after this, and it was back to using Sealed to play out from top 16, so the top 32 decks here did earn their top spots themselves. Girgia took a sizable portion of the top cut here, once again rivaling the Bear deck and Mermail, with Bujin once again close behind the pack. Tom Mock would take the event, using Bujin to claim his top 16 position before the draft moving the deck away from its stun roots to a more exceed-focused strategy with Bouge Incarnation covering its board flooding. This event would be directly before the year's gold series, and while the past few years had hit a solid groove with the sets, this year's would be… different to say the least. Premium Gold, release date March 28th, 2014, set type reprint set, major strategies the meta of the past year, OCG imports, all previous gold series. Impact, a new take on the gold series formula. Premium gold would be the first full shakeup of the gold series formula, not by introducing new rarities, although it did introduce the new gold secret rare, but also by importing OCG cards in the set in addition to the reprints it normally provided, which included a block of 10 cards from each of the previous gold series and 21 new to gold rare cards. While most of these imports held no impact, there were a couple in particular that were notably impactful, specifically in Beals of the Diabolic Dragon, a dark tuner locked level 8 synchro that can't be destroyed in battle and gains attack equal to any damage you take, being a solid inclusion for any dark deck that can make it. In addition to this, Ancient Pixie Dragon would be the manga counterpart to Ancient Fairy Dragon, drawing one after activating a field spell and can pop a monster on field if a field spell is active. Lastly for the imports would be the Gimmick Puppet Monsters, which we've seen some of previously, but here we would finally receive Dreary Doll, 
who can special summon herself from grave by banishing another gimmick puppet from grave. Magnet Doll, able to special summon itself from hand if your opponent has more monsters than you and you only control gimmick puppets. And Junk Puppet, an archetypal revival spell, which gave gimmick puppets the material to actually consistently summon their rank 8s, though it would still be notably weak in the meta. Reprints here included Lone Fire, Honest, Valor, Light Pulsar, Dark Flare, Eclipse Wyvern, Fire Fist Tiger King, Solar Recharge, Forbidden Chalice, Forbidden Lance, Tenki, Rhoda, Mirror Force, Torrential, Dad, Caius, Gold Sark, Mind Con, Bottomless, Judgment Dragon, Mizuki, Plague Spreader, Ryo, Stardust, Armor Master, Armed Wing, Icarus Attack, Morphing Jar, BLS, Chaos Sorcerer, Raikou, Celestia, and Summoner Monk. In addition to this, a new ban list would drop three days later on April 1st, attempting to shake up the meta manually, as the past few sets seem to have done nothing to change what decks were good. Newly banned were Morphing Jar 1 and 2, which was directly targeted at Empty Jar, a rogue level annoyance that never seemed to crack the YCS circuit in recent months, though notably this ban came directly following Morphing Jar's reprint in Premium Gold. Newly limited were Wolf Bark, a hit to the Bear deck, Abyss Gund, a hit to Mermail, Rekindling, a hit towards fire decks in general, but more so targeted at Fire King, and Infernity Barrier, a hit to Infernity. Newly semied were Seal of Convocation, a hit to Dragon Ruler's current best build, and Necroface, returning from one. Lastly, Unlimited were Magical Stone Excavation and Primal Seed, two points of cleanup. Overall, these hits were effectively slaps on the wrist for most of the top performing decks in the meta, though notably lacked any hits towards Girgia, which was about as old, if not older, than the other decks getting hit. YCS Mexico City would be the testing grounds following the new list, being another sealed top 16, and notably the top 32 for the most part remained unchanged, with the same four decks taking the majority of representation yet again. Alejandro Suarez would take the event through the sealed draft, using Mythic Rulers to pilot himself into the top 16, seeing another Dragon Ruler variant that could still compete following the January list, though he did not make his list public. YCS Vegas would be a week later, using the same draft format that would be standard for all draft events for the remainder of the year, and following the success of Mythic Rulers in Mexico City, the deck would rise a bit into the third place representation slot. Girgia and Mermail would continue to take those lion shares of the top cut, but notably, Firefist would see a rapid decline in its top cut performance following the limit of Wolf Bark, which in turn limited the amount of recursive rank 4s the deck could make. Denny Yu would be crowned the winner following the sealed draft, making it to top 16 using Heratic Ruler, being another example of the ruler strategy's relevance still remaining in whispers in the meta. This would lead to a new import set series premiering two weeks later, and though for the most part the OCG import sets up until now have been mostly unimpactful, this one was going to completely upend the balance of the meta as we knew it by introducing multiple meta warping threats. Dragons of Legend, release date April 25th, 2014, set type, import set, major strategies, Tamias, hands, impact, the beginnings of a beloved format. Dragons of Legend would be the first set in a long line of OCG import sets themed to the legendary dragons from the Season 4 filler arc of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! anime. As such, the primary card featured for this set would be the Eye of Tamias, a spell that lets you fuse a Dark Magician monster into a fusion that lists it as material using only that monster, able to access the classic Dark Paladin and Dark Flare Knight, but also the new targets of Dark Magician Girl the Dragon Knight, a fusion of DMG and a dragon, able to discard to pop a face-up card once per turn in either player's turn, an Amulet Dragon, a fusion of Dark Magician and a dragon that can banish any number of spells from Grave on Summon to boost its attack by 100 for each, floating into a spellcaster in Grave on Destruction. These were clearly trying to push a Dark Magician deck, but were far too little to get anything off the ground for that to be meta-relevant. However, these were not the imports that had people talking, as there were six more imports in this set that would all hold meta-relevance over the coming months. The first of these would be Curry Bandit, which in the end phase of the turn its normal summon can tribute itself to Excavate 5, add a spell trap from those to hand, and put the rest in the grave, being an insane starter for the theorized Sylvan deck, but also holding power as a heavy mill tool. The next would be Mathematician, who on normal summon could bend any level 4 or lower monster from deck to grave, drawing a card if destroyed by battle, being effectively a better version of Armageddon Knight for various strategies that also drew a card after, like Card Trooper, seeing play for these reasons. 
Next up was Wiretap, a counter trap that negates a trap and shuffles it back into deck for no cost. Being solid as most counter traps that did something similar required a cost of some kind. The last three, however, would be the most impactful of all. Fire and Ice Hand were a duo of cards that, on destruction, pop a monster in Fire Hand's case or a spell trap in Ice Hand's, and if you do, floats into a copy of the other. These two would be a powerful control engine of sorts that would be splashed into almost everything over the coming months, representing six total pops if they go uncountered. Lastly, Soul Charge was a spell that could, for the cost of a thousand life points of monster and your battle phase that turn, summon as many monsters as you'd like from the graveyard. Needless to say, a mass monster reborn was incredibly powerful, and on top of that, it was available at three copies on release, meaning that every deck could have access to a mass board revival for the cost of simple life points, which at this stage were becoming more and more of an expendable resource. YCS Paris would be held the same weekend, though a major point of note here needs to be that due to a logistical issue, Dragons of Legend would not be legal for the main event of this particular YCS. Peter Gross would take the event on Mermail, being his third YCS win after his two wins in 2012. The new cards of Dragons of Legend would have to wait just a bit longer to rock the meta, but they would have to share the stage with the next core set released three weeks later. Primal Origin, release date May 17th, 2014. Set type, core set. Major strategies, artifact, sylvan, Bujan. Impact, ending the Zexal era with the tip of the hat. Primal Origin would be the final core set of the Zexal era, and if it wanted to end the era with a bang, it absolutely accomplished that in spades, introducing a new meta archetype in addition to providing support waves to multiple other archetypes both in the meta and just outside of it, completely shaking things up prior to the WCQ circuit taking place over the next few months. The new archetype here was Artifact, a series of monsters that could be set in the spell trap zone, summoning themselves if popped on the opponent's turn while set there, including Moral Talk, who pops a face-up opponent's card when summoned on the opponent's turn, Beagle Talk, who pops up to two of your set cards if summoned on the opponent's turn, Scythe, a TCG exclusive that locks an opponent's extra deck summons if summoned on the opponent's turn, Durendal, a rank 5 that can detach a material to change an opponent's activated monster or normal spell trap effect to destroy a spell trap the opponent controls, and can detach one to mulligan both players' hands in either turn, with both effects being tied to the same once per turn restriction, Ignition, a quick play spell that pops a spell trap on the field, then sets an artifact monster from deck to the spell trap zone, able to skip the opponent's next battle phase if popped while set, and Sanctum, a trap that summons an artifact from deck, triggering their summon effect if it's the opponent's turn, and pops a card on field if destroyed while set. Artifacts were a solid engine of removal pieces, specifically in the case of Moral Talk with Sanctum, being considered as a splash engine for various decks in the meta to buff up their removal options. Sylvan would receive a solid second wave of support here in Cherub Sprout, able to excavate up to two on Special Summon, enable the Special Summon a level one plant from deck if excavated, Sage Koya, able to be Special Summon from hand if a Sylvan is sent to grave except in the damage step, can excavate one once per turn, and can recur a Sylvan spell trap if excavated, Princess Sprout, a TCG exclusive that can tribute herself to excavate one, send it to grave regardless of the results, and place a sprout monster in grave on top of the deck. And if excavated, special summons herself with any level between one and eight. Aurea, a rank seven that can send a plant from hand or field to grave to reorder cards on top of the deck equal to the level of the sent monster, and can detach one to excavate up to three cards, send any plants to grave, and bounce that many cards on field to hand. And Charity, a spell that lets you draw three, then stack two, including a sylvan, from hand on top of the deck, stacking every card in hand if you don't have a Sylvan. This wave would iron out a ton of the issues that Sylvan had from its initial debut, with Sage and Princess specifically filling a major void in the excavation access and Charity reading almost like a custom card for the archetype. But whether or not it would perform would have to be seen in the YCS and WCQ circuit. Bujin would receive a couple of new cards here in Harume, a Beast Warrior Bujin that must be special summoned by banishing a Bujin from Grave except itself, and rips a card from both players' hand on destruction. Sinyu, a TCG exclusive that can banish itself from Grave to boost a Bujin by the attack of the battling monster, having battle damage from that battle. And Amaterasu, a 3 material rank 4 that can detach one to either summon a banished level 4 lower on your turn, or add a banished level 4 lower to hand on the opponent's turn. The support would be solid for Bujin all around, giving the deck an in archetype honest of sorts as well as more rank 4 swarming options, seeing a boost in the deck's play rate from this support. 
Moving into the standalones, Trap Tricks would receive Dianea, with the standard Trap Tricks immunity, special summons a Trap Tricks from Grave on Normal, and sets a whole normal trap from Grave on Special, being an incredibly powerful piece to pair with a previously released Mermelio for a splash engine. Madolce would receive Angeli, with the standard Madolce reshuffle effect and contribute herself to summon a Madolce from deck, shuffling it back into the deck at the end phase of your next turn, which was an incredible starter for Madolce by giving the deck immediate access to Hoot Cake, who already had a monster engrave to banish thanks to Angeli's tribute not triggering the shuffle back effect. Majesty's Fiend was a counterpart to the previously released Vanity's Fiend, locking monster effects while on the field, being a solid counter strategy to various decks in many different metagames. Number 103 Ragna Zero was a new rank 4 option, able to detach to pop a monster who has a different attack than its original, drawing a card if you do, being a solid tech choice for countering out some decks. Number 80, Rhapsody and Berserk was another rank 4 option, able to detach one to banish a card in the opponent's grave and can equip itself onto another Exceed to boost that monster by 1200 attack, being considered as another tech choice for the banish effect primarily. Karen Gorgon was yet another new rank 4 option, able to detach one to change any card's singular target to itself if able, being primarily played as one of the strongest rank 4 bodies on 2450 that still had a decent effect attached. Exceeds Universe is a trap that sends two Exceeds to Grave to summon a non-number Exceed with a rank that is equal to the combined ranks of the sent Exceeds or one less attaching itself as material to that monster, being mostly niche in its applications, but did give rank 4 focused decks the ability to access the rank 7 and 8 pool in a roundabout way. Evo Singularity was a new trap for the Evol archetype, able to summon an Evil Czar from the extra deck and attach an Evo Tile and Evil Czar from Grave to it as material, being a powerful cheat out option for the floundering strategy. Lastly, and the band played on was a continuous trap that locks summoning of monsters with the same level or rank as monsters you already controlled, being a solid floodgate option against various exceed strategies. YCS Philadelphia would be the same weekend, being another top 16 sealed event, and though Gyrgyz would continue to dominate the space, a very clear change was present from the top 32. The engines present in the past couple of packs would pop up in various strategies throughout the top 32, but most notably would be mixed with each other to form their own standalone decks, like Trap Tricks Hand, Hands, artifact trap tricks, and what would become the face of the format in retrospect, hat, short for hand artifact trap tricks, which would mix the titular engines together to form a tight control package, with the hands providing their monster and spell trap pops in combination with board swarming, the artifacts providing disruption and rank 5 access through moral and beagle talk, and trap tricks providing access to bottomless and trap tricks trap hole nightmare, while also providing spell trap removal and rank 4 access. This deck would become the face of this period of Yu-Gi-Oh's history, known as Hat Format, which would be considered one of the few times in post-5D's Yu-Gi-Oh where a deck that is very much a control strategy would be the dominant force on the metagame. Chris LeBlanc would win the event following the Top 16 draft, using Madolce to reach Top 16, sporting not only the new Angeli line, but also Fire and Ice Hand to help clean up board states, marking the player's second YCS victory following Providence in 2012. This would lead into the next structure deck over a month later, and with most players using the results from the YCS to prepare for the upcoming WCQ circuit, the structure deck would be the last opportunity to provide any kind of shakeup to the already shattered apart metagame. Realm of Light, release date June 27th, 2014. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Light Sworn. Impact, a revitalization to Miller's. Realm of Light would be the second of three structure decks aimed at providing new support to previously meta archetypes, this time being Light Sworn, who would receive three new monsters to bolster their ranks, being Raiden, a tuner that's able to mill two to boost himself by 200 for each Light Sworn milled this way, milling two more in the end phase, Minerva, a tuner who searches a light dragon on normal whose level is less than or equal to your light sworn names in grave, milling two in the end phase, and mills one when sent from hand or deck to grave, and Michael, a level seven light lock sinker that can pay a thousand to banish a card on field, shuffles back any number of light sworns in grave on destruction, gaining 300 life points for each, and mills three in the end phase. These three would each see their own usage both within Lightsworn strategies and in general, with Raiden specifically seeing the most usage due to being a miller that is also a tuner for synchro pool access, making him extremely useful for various strategies. Reprints here included JD, Celestia, Jane, Lila, Gareth, Wolf, Aaron, Lumina, Arcus, Ryko, Honest, Blackwing Zephyros, Necrogardna, Solar Recharge, Charge, Foolish, and Breakthrough Skill. 
The WCQ circuit for the year would begin with the European WCQ on June 29th, and for the most part we'd see similar results to Philadelphia, with Gear Gear remaining the top deck and Hat remaining in the top three. There were a couple of other decks, however, in the top cut worth talking about. Sylvan would see its first set of premier event tops, seeing three total, with Sage Koya ironing out many of the archetype's boss monster issues and Sylvan Charge being one of the best enablers the deck could have asked for. Utilizing all of the archetype's power cards in addition to plant staples like Lone Fire Blossom and Rose Archer, as well as the mass excavation and dump tool that was Curry Bandit, fitting extremely nicely into the archetype. The other breakout success here would be Light Sworn Ruler, tying Hat for representation and utilizing the newly released Light Sworn structure deck with Raiden and Minerva in tow, similarly utilizing Curry Bandit for the massive mills he provided. Eugen Height would take the event on Mermail, showing the deck can still perform in the metagame despite the heavily shifting landscape around it. The South American WCQ would be the same weekend, and Hat would see a far more pronounced performance here, taking a fourth of the representation at eight slots from the top 32. Roger Moran would take the event on Machina Gadget, being a surprising run for the deck to take, notably playing the singular copy that was allowed of Radox, providing Grave Revival and Rank 7 access. Extremely notably here looking at the top decks, Hat Variants took 11 total top spots, with 17 decks across the 32 running the hand package in some shape or form, showing the engine's dominance and staying power. The Oceania WCQ would be the next weekend, but unfortunately due to poor coverage we only know the top 4 here, where Girgia would clear into 3 of the 4 spots, with Donald Thompson defeating all of them to take the event with Fire Fist Artifact Hand, trading out the Trap Tricks engine of most hat builds for a Fire Fist package. The Central America WCQ would be the same weekend, and Dolce would have a surprising showing here, taking 5 top spots and landing in 2nd for representation. More notably were the Hat Cores, which managed to weave their way into the top cut seamlessly here, with Hands appearing in 9 lists, Trap Tricks in 7, and Artifacts in 5. Jose Lagunes would take the event on Mermail, being another surprising victory for the deck to grab. Lastly would be the North American WCQ, being held the next weekend, and unfortunately most of the coverage of this particular event has been lost to time, though we do know some of the goings on through Attendee Testament. Though the deck was solid, most pro players in the North American circuit were actively lying about the strength of Sylvan as a combo deck in the meta, saving their list for this specific event, and it would perform well, being one of the most represented decks that we know of from this particular event, with some innovations to the strategy including Blaster being used as a rank 7 enabler with Sage Koya, Miracle Fertilizer putting in insane work due to the ruling that its destruction effect will not trigger if a monster that it revives is used as exceed material, and Spore being used not only as a Tuner, but as exceed material for rank 8s by banishing a Sage Koya for its summon. Corey McDuffie would take the event on Hat, being the first premier event win for the rapidly rising strategy, notably playing Pot of Dichotomy thanks to its various types the deck utilized. The day after the NAWCQ, the ban list would be updated, notably being the first time a non-emergency ban list would take effect on a date that wasn't the first of the month, being July 14th, though clearly the list was delayed as to not interfere with the WCQ events already scheduled. Newly limited were Gear Gear, Gear the primary combo piece of the Gear Gear strategy, and Goyo Guardian, being released from his band status. Newly semi-limited were Formula Synchron, Magician of Faith, and Rhoda, all coming back from one. Lastly, newly unlimited were Dimensional Prison and Mirror Force, sparking a bit of debate around these two specifically due to their natures as powerful battle traps, especially Mirror Force, but in retrospect, that call was correct, as their time was coming to an end. We were standing on the precipice of a new era, and though it wouldn't officially start for another month, the year's starter deck would give us a hint as to what was in store. Space Time Showdown, release date July 11th, 2014, set type, starter deck, major strategies, summoners, magicians, empowered warriors, impact, what the hell is that? Space Time Showdown would be the year starter deck, and as such would also be our first look at the new mechanic for the Arc 5 era, Pendulums. These monster spell hybrids can either be summoned as normal or set in one of the newly coined pendulum scales, a new zone placed on each side of the board, with a unique effect for where it was placed. When destroyed, pendulums go to the extra deck face up rather than the graveyard, and most importantly, once per turn, if you have two pendulum monsters in your scales, you can perform a pendulum summon, allowing you to summon as many monsters as you'd like from hand or extra deck to the field whose levels are between the two scale numbers. 
For example, the Pendulum Monsters introduced here, Stargazer and Timegazer Magicians, have a scale of 1 and 8 respectively. That would mean that while they're in scale, you can Pendulum Summon out any monsters between the levels of 2 and 7, and upon finding this out, the community lost their collective minds. The idea of being able to summon out massive bosses for effectively free signaled the end of Yu-Gi-Oh, as many called it. However, this was completely overblown. There was experimentation initially with cards like Jinzo and Miss Valley Apex Avian being cheated out, but the reality of the situation was that because of the lack of pendulum monsters, the mechanic was nowhere near as busted as people would think initially. Aside from these two, the only new release here worth noting was Supply Squad, a continuous spell that lets you draw a card once per turn when a monster is destroyed which would see some play in the coming months with certain strategies. Lastly, with the release of this starter deck, there were a couple of adjustments to the master rules alongside the pendulum changes. The first of these was there could now be an active field spell on each side of the field, meaning that you and your opponent no longer had to fight for field spell priority, though up until this point that rarely happened to begin with. The second, and far more important to the long term of the game, was that the player going first no longer drew for the start of their first turn. This was an incredibly important important change, as now there was a real sacrifice for choosing to go first over going second, and though most players would still choose to set up first over the extra card moving forward, it did introduce an interesting dynamic into the decision process. Following this year's starter deck, Battle Pack 3 Monster League would release on August 1st, being most notable for shifting what draft pack would be used for YCSs for the remainder of the year, but also had an interesting twist for drafts using it, as all monsters would be considered all types being exceptionally interesting as a sealed draft product for that reason, in addition to reprints of Levier the Sea Dragon, Digusto Emerald, Gargaga Cowboy, Diamond Direwolf, and Ghostrick Alucard. The World Championship would be a week later from August 9th to the 10th, and this would be one of the most interesting years in terms of coordination for Worlds, as it would be the first time that both band lists had to be taken into account. In previous years, what the ban list would encompass was never really up for discussion since both regions followed the same list. However, since the TCG OCG split, Worlds would need to have a ban list that effectively combined the harshest hits from both regions, leaving some decks in a much weaker or stronger state than initially expected, especially with the removal of exclusives from both pools. Because of this, and despite having multiple hits on the ban list, Infernity would move to be the most successful deck at the event, taking three of the top eight as well as the world champion title piloted by Sahabi Karadine of Canada, marking himself as the 2014 world champion. This would be the final event of the Zexal era, fittingly enough, and as we moved into the next era of the game, the core set kickoff would do more than just reset the previous meta, it was going to obliterate it into the stratosphere. Duelist Alliance. Release date, August 15th, 2014. Set type, Core Set. Major strategies, Satellar Knight, Shadal, Burning Abyss. Impact, the beginning of modern Yu-Gi-Oh! Duelist Alliance is considered by most in the community to be the exact moment when the older version of Yu-Gi-Oh! officially pivoted to the modern era, being one of the strongest set releases of all time. But why is that? We've had era kickoffs that heavily impacted the meta before, like in the case of Duelist Genesis, and this one wasn't even that strong of a start for the pendulum mechanic at all, so why is this the pivot point? Well, it's not about the mechanics here, it's about card and deck design. Up until this point, most formats have a significant amount of back and forth, specifically in the viability of trap cards, especially summon responders and battle traps, and that was because at the time, decks operated at a speed that was forgiving enough to allow for those kind of disruptions, especially in the meta recently here with hat format being effectively a control-centered metagame. With the release of Duelist Alliance, it wouldn't change immediately, but it would be felt over the coming months as the game slowly transitioned away from back row heavy games and focused a lot more heavily on the strategies and archetypes own inner strengths to build boards with, and fast. The set would introduce a new monster type in Worms, and five new archetypes into the meta, ranging from rogue picks to the absolute top tier. So let's start with the core three, with each being based on one of the previous summoning mechanics aimed at taking that mechanic higher than before. The first of these was Satellar Knight, the Exceed archetype of the bunch, aimed at using their light warriors to quickly swarm the board, gain resources, and enable three material rank fours. This first wave included Deneb, who searched a Teller Knight on summon except itself, Altair, able to revive a Teller Knight on summon, Vega, who summoned a Teller Knight from hand on summon, Anukali, who dumped a Teller Knight from deck on summon, 
Deltros, a three material rank four that keeps the opponent from responding to a summon and can detach to pop a card on field once per turn. Floating into a Teller Knight when sent to Grave, Skybridge, which swaps the Teller Knight on field for one in deck with a different name, and Stellar Nova Alpha, a counter trap for spell traps that sends a Teller Knight from field to Grave as cost, drawing a card on resolution. This deck would be heavily reliant on its back row line, similar to the decks of the Hat era, and as such, though it did see a fair amount of success in the coming months, the moment more options were available in the pool, so Teller Knight would fall out of favor just as quickly as it came in. The second archetype was Shadal focused on fusions, which not only had all of their monsters include effects when sent to grave, but also flip effects on all of their main deck pieces, being a pseudo revival of the flip mechanic that we haven't seen in quite some time. This included Falco, who revives a Shadal face down on flip and summons itself face down when sent by effect, Hedgehog, who searches a Shadal spell trap on flip and a monster if sent by effect, Squamata, who destroys a monster on flip or dumps a Shadal from deck if sent by effect, Dragon, who bounces a card on flip or pops a spell trap if sent by effect. Beast, who draws two and discards one when flipped or draws one if sent by effect. Winda, a fusion of a Shadal and a Dark that can't be destroyed by opponent's card effects and locks both players to one special summon a turn, recurring a Shadal spell trap to hand when sent to grave. Construct, a fusion of a Shadal and a Light that dumps a Shadal card on summon and destroys any special summon monster at battles, recurring a Shadal spell trap to hand when sent to grave. Sinister Shadow Games, which dumps the Shadal from deck to flip any number of set Shadals face up. Core, able to summon itself as an effect monster with any attribute for a Shadal fusion summon, recurring a Shadal spell trap to hand when sent to grave. And lastly, and most importantly, Shadal Fusion, a fusion spell for Shadals using hand or field, but could also use materials from deck if the opponent controlled any monster summoned from the extra deck. Shadal Fusion specifically would be the catalyst for an absolute overhaul to the fusion mechanic as a whole, with almost every deck that used fusions in a relevant way having a Shadal Fusion-like card for the foreseeable future. Though Shadal was recognizably powerful out the gate thanks to this incredible first wave of support, aside from the usage of core, they had no way to access Construct in Archetype causing the deck to be mixed with other popular light attribute engines to offset this, most commonly being the artifacts and light swarms. The third archetype was Yang Zing, the synchro archetype of the group, being the introduction of the new worm type as well, with all of their monsters sharing a common effect to float into another Yang Zing name when destroyed, each being a different attribute, and all of the non-tuners both allowing quick synchros on the opponent's turn using only Yang Zings, and gave their Synchro monster an additional effect, with Suwani boosting the Synchro by 500, Bian preventing battle destruction, Bixie providing trap immunity, and Pulao providing spell immunity, while Chiwen, the tuner of the bunch, could revive itself when a Yang Zing is destroyed. Their Synchro target, Baxia, was a level 8 Wormlock Synchro that spun away cards on summon up to the different attributes used to make him, and could pop a card you control to revive a level 4 or lower once per turn, triggering the Yang Zing summon effects. Lastly for spell traps, Path let you cycle back three Yang Zings to deck to draw two, and Creation let you, if a monster you control is destroyed, summon a Yang Zing from deck once per turn, being effectively an additional Yang Zing float. Yang Zing would have its rounds of experimentation off of this initial wave, but was considerably slower than both Teller and Shadal, leaving it easily as the weakest of the three core archetypes. The last two archetypes here were actually both TCG exclusive archetypes, with Konami of America aiming to introduce two different archetypes here to build out over the course of the next few core sets, rather than sinking all of their time and effort into Noble Knights 2.0. The first of these was UA, a series of warriors based on various sports that can summon themselves from hand by bouncing another UA to hand once per turn. This first wave gave us Mighty Slugger, who stuns cards and effects while attacking, Perfect Ace, able to discard on the opponent's turn to negate any card or effect once per turn, and Stadium, a field spell that searches a UA monster when you normal summon a UA, and permanently boosts all UAs by 500 the first time a UA is special summoned each turn. UA had the bones to be a decent rogue level deck here with this start, but absolutely needed more support to go anywhere, especially needing a no tribute normal summon specifically to be able to trigger Stadium reliably. The second, and easily more important of the two, was Burning Abyss, a series of level 3 fiends based on the Divine Comedy, with each main deck monster sharing an effect that they would be automatically destroyed if they shared the field with a non-Burning Abyss monster, and could all be special summoned from hand while you control no spells or traps, with each also having an effect when sent to Grave, with Graf summoning a Burning Abyss from deck, Seer summoning one from Grave, and Skarm, who searched a level 3 Dark Fiend in the end phase of the turn at sent to Grave, with these effects sharing a hard once per turn with their summon effects. 
They would also receive an Exceed monster in Dante, a rank 3 that could detach and mill up to 3 to boost his attack by 500 for each card milled that turn, swapping to defense mode if he attacked, recurring a BA to hand if sent to grave. Lastly, Traveler could summon any number of Burning Abyss monsters sent to grave that turn. While it seems like this was only a small wave, which it was being only 5 cards in total, Burning Abyss would go from this wave to be an absolutely dominant threat in the metagame for the foreseeable future, similarly to Shadal, which we'll see with the next YCS. Moving into the one-off pieces, Odd Eyes Pendulum Dragon would be the only noteworthy addition to the pendulum mechanic here, able to pop itself in scale during the end phase to search for any pendulum with 1500 or less attack, being also notable as it was the Arc 5 protagonist ace monster. So while low impact now, it was certain to get more support over the next few years, like how Stardust and Utopia had before it. Artifacts would receive Lancia, who was interesting as it didn't have to be on field for its effect as opposed to its kin able to tribute itself from hand or field as a quick effect to prevent all banishing until the next turn, being considerable as a side deck option. Nefarious Archfiend Eater of Nefariousness is a level 4 that can summon itself from hand if you control a spellcaster, able to pop a monster on your field in the opponent's end phase to summon itself from grave, being considered as an option for Shadal specifically as it could be used as both Exceed material and as a way to pop your monsters for their effects. Battery Man 9 Volt on summon, searches a battery man monster and doubles its attack and defense, destroying itself in your next end phase, being such a powerful piece of search capability for the deck in addition to being summonable off of charger that it would help battery man see rogue level play in success in the coming months. Castell the Skyblaster Musketeer was a new rank 4 that could either detach 1 to flip a monster face down, or detach 2 to spin away a face up card, being an extremely powerful addition to the generic rank 4 pool. Magical Spring let the user draw cards equal to the face up spell traps the opponent controls, then discard equal to the face up spell traps you control, being specifically billed as a counter for the pendulum strategy, which would see side deck play as pendulums grew more popular. The Monarch Stormforth allowed the user to tribute summon using an opponent's monster that turn, locking summons from the extra deck during the turn it's used, being effectively a better version of Soul Exchange for many tribute summon focused decks, like Monarch and Battery Man. Time Space Trap Hole could, when the opponent special summons from the hand or extra deck, spin that monster back, dealing a thousand to the user for each, being a considerable tool for decks utilizing the Trap Tricks monsters. Lastly, Fearless Lightsworn Archer was an OCG import that was a tuner and, when sent from deck to grave by card effect, special summoned herself, able to tribute herself to pop a monster and mill three, being exceptionally powerful for Shadal specifically as a material for construct using Fusion's deck material requirement. Without question, Duelist Alliance would completely change the game as we knew it forever, though would have to wait a few weeks for the first true opportunity to prove itself, with another set release occurring between then and now, which itself would be a monumental change for the game as a whole. Twenty fourteen Megatens. Release date August twenty ninth, twenty fourteen. Set type reprint set. Major strategies. Every single relevant card from Tachyon to Valiant. Impact, lowering the price of the previous meta. The 2014 Megatens would be a new yearly staple in the game as a whole, bringing reprints for every powerful card from a core set release in the previous year, with this one covering Tachyon, Judgment, Spectres, and Valiant. In addition to these reprints, they also came with 10 promos that also guaranteed certain reprints, being Tiger King, Susanoo, Gorilla, Nightmare Shark, and Crane. As for the relevant reprints in these packs, every mega pack included one secret, ultra, super, and rare, with all of the cards in this collection matching their rarity from their original sets, bringing easy access reprints of Armades, the Bougens, Coach Soldier Wolfbark, Constellar Omega and Sombre, Divine Dragon Knight Felgrand, Evil Swarm Exiton Knight and Kerkion, the Fire Fists, Girgia Gear, the Ghost Tricks, the Harpies, Hootcake, the Mecha Phantom Beasts, Mistake, the Mythic Dragons, Master Key, Astral Force, Sacred Sword, Silent Honor Arc, Star Eater, The Sylvans, Transmodify, The Trap Trixes, Wyver Burster, and Collapse Serpent, and Exceeds Encore. In addition to this, the 5D's Manga Volume 6 would release here, giving us Hot Red Dragon Archfiend, a level 8 synchro that popped all other attack position monsters on the field once per turn, being sort of the opposite of the original RDA, who nuked defense monsters. YCS Madrid would be the first YCS of the era, taking place on September 7th, and almost immediately we'd see the result of the new releases and how they would be putting the previous meta landscape to shame. Shadal, Satellar Knight, and Burning Abyss would together take over three-fourths of the top cut representation here, which would actually grow more substantial over the course of the following months. 
Burning Abyss would see four top spots here, with a couple of extremely notable inclusions seeing play here in this build. Thanks to the lack of Burning Abyss names, many other monsters would be played here to help fill the gaps for now, such as Rise Up for tributing over a special summon BA, and Mathematician for dumping a BA for setup. One card though that was absolutely not a space filler was Tour Guide, who could summon any Burning Abyss from deck with her effect, negating their destruction condition on the field, able to make a rank 3 to detach the summoned BA and trigger their effect, most commonly hitting Skarm this way as Skarm's end phase search could also grab Tour Guide. Another interesting tech piece here was Rank Up Magic Astral Force, able to turn a spent Dante into Constellar Pallades, able to add itself to hand for your draw if you milled it using Dante. Satellar Knight would take the second largest slice, feeling very similar to the control decks of the previous format thanks to the heavy amounts of back row that the deck relied heavily on to make up for its limitations. As standardly, you could make a 3 material rank 4 easily, but beyond that relied heavily on resource management between copies of Altair and Deneb to carry the grind game, with Stellar Nova Alpha specifically being one of the most key pieces of their back row lineups. Shadal would take half of the top 32 representation, as well as first place piloted by Joshua Schmidt, utilizing three Moral Talk and one Feelist to cover the light requirements for Construct Summon, as well as providing access to BLS on a whim. Also very notable here was a card in the side deck that would become a major trouble point for many players in the meta, being Super Polymerization. The card up until now had seen very little play due to never having a deck it could really take advantage of, with the closest being some builds of Hero Beat in the 5Ds and Zexal eras. Here though, with so much more of the meta a pivoting towards lights and darks, Super Poly would become an end-all monster removal piece thanks to being completely unrespondable, which gave Shadal a significant advantage moving deeper into the format. The other side here is how Shadal Fusion was effectively a boss monster and two foolish burials at any point the opponent left an extra deck monster on the field, which would continue growing in power as the format went on. With these decks, we would also see the rise in one particular trap card. Vanity's Emptiness was now seeing play in literally every deck of the format, usually at 2-3 copies in the main, entirely thanks to the new threats of the meta taking extreme advantage of board flooding special summons, and this issue was only going to get worse. Joshua would also be the first recipient of the new season's YCS prize card, Ascension Sky Dragon, which while possible to summon was not nearly as useful as the previous season's giant hand and builds. YCS Toronto would be held the same weekend, being another top 16 sealed event, being the first one played with a new Battle Pack 3, but arguably, just as notably, the entire top 32 would be filled out by the new Duelist Alliance decks, with Shadal once again taking the lion's share. Patrick Hoban would take the event after the draft cut, piloting Shadal to the top 16, notably playing three Super Poly in the main to handle all of the Duelist Alliance matchups. Something else that would become very much a trend in the community following this specific top would be the inclusion of Upstart Goblin at three copies in many 40 card decks. While the trend had come and gone a few times before in the past, this card would see a massive spike in popularity following Hoban's usage, with the term Upstart Hoban being a common occurrence with a theory of playing 3 Upstart in a 40 card deck, you're effectively playing a 37 card deck. YCS Lima would be the following week, but unfortunately we have no information at all about this particular event other than knowing the winner was German Pina, who we don't even know the deck of. Over the next few weeks, a few changes would hit the game one after the other, the first being the release of the game Zexel World Duel Carnival, which brought its promo cards Night Express Night and Special Schedule, cards meant to help enable a level and rank 10 strategy, specifically around Gustav Max at the time, but for the time being would be irrelevant. Following this would be another banlist update, taking effect on October 1st, and would be aimed at solving a few of the early issues with the format as well as balancing out some of the previously hit cards. Newly limited were Infernity Archfiend, a hit to the world's winning deck as is tradition, Soul Charge, a massive hit to the three of Staple, Super Poly, a hit to the absolute power play of Shadal, and Glow Up Bulb and Raigeki, both returning from zero with Raigeki specifically turning many heads as it was still a powerful single-sided board clear, but whether it would see play in a format of Grave Triggers would have to be seen. Newly semi-limited, and all returning from one, would be Gale, Gores, Ceasefire, and Transmigration Prophecy, all of which had since passed their relevance. Lastly, unlimited were Coach Soldier Wolfbark, Formula Synchron, Magician of Faith, and Rhoda, with many of these turning heads towards previously rogue to unplayable strategies. YCS Dallas would be the first event after this list, taking place on October 5th, being another top 16 sealed, and once again, the Duelist Alliance decks would take almost all of the representation, being 31 of the top 32. Billy Brake would be crowned the winner after draft, piloting his way to top 16 with a 60 card control pile, being a hybrid between Shadal and Burning Abyss, with Curry Bandit providing heavy milling between them, marking the player's third YCS win. 
Directly following this, the next Shonen Jump promo would be released, being Ebon Illusion Magician, a rank 7 able to detach to summon a normal spellcaster from deck, obviously intended to summon Dark Magician. In addition, it can also banish an opponent's card when a normal spellcaster attacks. This wouldn't be relevant at the time being, but a point worth noting here is that Ebon's alternative summoning method was, at the time, not possible to perform in the TCG of overlaying onto a rank 6 spellcaster, as the card this was intended to work with, Maji Maji Magician Gal, was never imported to the TCG due to Kazuki Takahashi, the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh and the artist behind the card, refusing for censorship to occur on it, which would have had to happen for the TCG's localization policies at the time. This would lead into the next structure deck a few weeks later, and if there was anything poised to do something about the absolute dominance of Duelist Alliance meta, I'm not sure this was it. Girgia Rampage. Release date, October 17th, 2014. Set type, structure deck. Major strategies, Girgia. Impact, making a tier 3 deck cheap. Gear Gear Rampage would be the third and final structure deck of the year, being aimed at supplying support back to Gear Gear, who up until very recently were an extremely capable deck in the metagame. Their new support here included Attacker, who could pop spell traps up to the number of Gear Gears you control when flipped, able to flip itself back down, Augur, who searches the level 4 Earth Machine on normal, Mark III, able to special a Gear Gear from hand or grave when summoned by a Gear Gear card effect, and Gear 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 Gigant XG, a 3 material rank 3 that can detach a material when a machine battles to negate all face up effects from the opponent and stun their effects for the attack, recurring a Gear Gear when sent to grave. These pieces were fairly hit or miss overall, with XG specifically being just too cumbersome to get out due to needing 3 level 3s to access, though the other 3 would find their own spaces in the existing deck. Reprints here included the entire Gear Gia core and Card Trooper, which made the deck extremely cheap and easy to obtain for newer players, though it wouldn't be as successful as the new Duelist Alliance strategies. Speaking of new players though, another reprint set would be released just a week later, and this one was set to be a little hit or miss, but would reprint a few cards everyone needed now. Legendary Collection 5Ds, release date, October 24th, 2014. Set type, reprint set. Major strategies, the 5D staples. Impact, reprinting a buggy boy in a floodgate. Legendary Collection 5Ds is a weird one to talk about in retrospect solely because almost none of its reprints were actually relevant to the meta with the exception of exactly two, which were sorely needed at this point. Maxi and Vanity's Emptiness were those reprints, as both had exploded in usefulness over the course of the last few months and were starting to reach higher prices, so the reprints were greatly appreciated, but left the rest of the set feeling like a bit of an unfocused mess for the time. Reprints here included Effect Veiler, Stardust Dragon, Formula Synchron, One for One, Starlight Road, Battle Fader, Crimson Blader, Glow Up Bulb, Black Rose Dragon, the Blackwing Core, TG Hyper Librarian, and Shooting Quasar Dragon, which was the first EU legal printing of the Synchro Boss. YCS London would be held the same weekend, and unsurprisingly, we'd see no movement outside of the Duelist Alliance decks further solidifying their hierarchy structure, with Marcel Barberi taking the event on Shadal. This takes us to the final core set of the year, and realistically, a meta shakeup wouldn't be here since the Duelist Alliance decks were certain to be getting new support, but maybe a new deck would be able to rise up into the heavily cold landscape. The New Challengers. Release date, November 7th, 2014. Set type, Core Set. Major Strategies, Cliffort, Shadal, Burning Abyss. Impact, more fuel on the fire. New Challengers, being the follow-up set to Duelist Alliance, was bound to be an impactful one, bringing both new archetypes to the metagame as well as boosting the power levels of previously introduced ones. Here we got two new archetypes worth talking about, the first one being Fluffle, a new fusion archetype that was actually three different archetypes rolled into one, being Fluffle, Edge Imp, and Frightfur. With this initial wave, we received Edge Imp Sabers, able to summon itself from grave by stacking a card in hand on top of the deck. Bear, able to be sent from hand to grave to set a toy vendor from deck, able to tribute itself to recur a polymerization from grave to hand. Dog, able to search a Fluffle monster or Edge Imp Sabers on summon. Owl, able to search polymerization on summon, able to pay 500 while on field to fusion summon a Fright Fur. Cat, able to recur a polymerization from grave to hand when used as fusion material. Fright Fur Bear, a fusion of Fluffle Bear and Edge Imp Sabers, able to equip monsters it destroys in battle to itself, boosting by a thousand for each. 
Fright for Wolf, a fusion of sabers and any number of fluffles, able to attack once for each material used, and Toy Vendor, a continuous spell that can discard one to draw a card, reveal it, and if it's a fluffle monster, summon a monster from hand, otherwise discard it, able to search a fluffle or edge imp sabers when sent to grave. While interesting on release, fluffle would move to do very little initially, with almost all relevance for the time being relegated to Wolf's OTKs, which saw some minor rogue level play at the time but would be an archetype to watch over the coming years. The other archetype was Cliffort, a series of machine pendulums that are mostly able to be summoned without tributes, dropping their level and attack values when you do, are unaffected by monster effects of an equal or lower level if normal summoned, and having some form of effect when either tributed or tribute summoned. This initial wave included Scout, a normal monster scale 9 pendulum who can pay 8 to search for a Klee card from deck while in the scale, Carrier, who bounces a monster on field when tributed, Helix, who pops a spell trap when tributed, Disc, who summons two Klees from decks if Tribute summoned, popping them in the end phase. Shell, able to attack twice and pierce if Tribute summoned. Towers, the only non-Pendulum in the archetype, requiring three Tributes to summon, is unaffected by spells, traps, and activated monster effects with a lower level or rank, drops all special summoned monsters by 500 attack, and makes your opponent send a card from hand or field to grave of their choice once per turn and Sacrifice, an equipped spell that boosts by 300, makes the monster unable to be destroyed in battle, treats that monster as two tributes for a Klee summon, and searches a Klee monster when sent to grave. Cliffort on release was immediately recognized as the first truly good pendulum strategy, but rather than what pendulums would be known for being their primary trait, Klees would effectively use pendulum summoning as a means to an end, summoning out material to tribute over for their boss monsters, most commonly for towers, being one of the strongest monsters in the game at this point as it was almost completely unoutable, though this discovery would actually be kept under wraps for a few months. Because of this, as well as their ability to go back to normal attack values under skill drain, Cliffort would find a place in the meta almost immediately as a stun strategy, which we'd see with the next YCS. So Teller Knight would receive a couple of new support pieces here in Sirius, who provided a Pot of Avarice-like effect, shuffling back five Teller Knights from Grave to draw one on Summon, being a critical piece of the deck by reloading their key resources like Altair, and Triver, a three material Teller Knight locked rank four that bounces the entire field on summon except for itself, able to detach one to hand rip the opponent for one card, reviving a Teller Knight from grave if sent to the grave while it still had material. While this would be an incredibly powerful second wave for the deck, plugging multiple holes in their strategy, so Teller Knight would continue to be the weakest of the three Duelist Alliance strategies with meta relevance, which would become apparent over the next few YCSs. Shadal would receive a couple of new fusion pieces in Grista, the fire fusion that can negate a special summon by sending a Shadal card from hand to grave with the same fusion float effect as normal, Shekinaga, the earth fusion who can negate the effects of a special summon monster and destroy them by sending a Shadal from hand to grave, and has the standard fusion floating effect, as well as the new fusion spell in El Shadal Fusion, a quick play spell with the standard fusion conditions. While very unassuming, Shekinaga and El Shadal Fusion would be almost instantly slotted in, with Mathematician filling the Earth requirements and El Fusion providing a pseudo-tagout option for your fusions to dodge removal and disruption. Yang Xing would receive a couple of new pieces here too in Zhao Tu, a tuner with the standard float effect and can, if you control no other monsters, discard two Yang Xing cards to summon a Yang Xing with zero attack and another with zero defense from the deck. Tao Ti, a dark non-tuner who makes his synchro unable to be stolen by the opponent, and Yazi, a level 7 synchro that can't be targeted with effects, can pop a Yang Zing and another card the opponent controls once per turn, and if destroyed floats into any worm in the deck. While still not meta, this support would iron out a lot of the early game issues Yang Zing faced, giving the deck an instant starter thanks to Zhao Tu's swarming effect. Burning Abyss would receive a second wave of support here in Alec, who negates a monster's effect that turn when sent to grave, Cow Cap, who bounces a set spell or trap when sent to grave, Rubik, a Burning Abyss tuner monster, and Virgil, a level 6 synchro that can discard a BA to spin away an opponent's card once per turn, able to draw a card if destroyed. This wave would be well received by the strategy, namely in that any monsters that had the BA summon condition and BA name would have been well received, with Rubik and Virgil doing numbers for the strategy and the other two seeing one of play occasionally. UA would also receive another new wave in Midfielder, being a no-tribute UA that can bounce a different UA to summon a UA from hand on a quick effect, Goalkeeper, who can prevent a UA from being destroyed once per turn on a quick effect, and Powered Jersey, an equipped spell that boosts a UA by a thousand and doubles the damage it deals in battle against monsters, returning the hand if the equipped UA is bounced. 
While this wouldn't make UA meta, it would fill a major hole in the strategy thanks to midfielder being able to trigger stadium search on the first turn, which would let the strategy see minor rogue level play. Moving into the one-offs, Denkoseko would be a level 4 that locks spells and traps from being set or activated while set while on the field, being an instant staple for Shadal decks for stunning back row and potentially being used for Construct Summon, forming a variant of the deck known as Denko Dolls. Herald of Ultimateness was a level 12 ritual that could discard a fairy to negate any spell, trap, monster effect, or inherent special summon of a monster, being effectively a better version of the previously released Herald of Perfection, not seeing play now but being experimented with over time. Herald of the Arclight was a level 4 synchro that could tribute itself to negate any spell, trap, or monster effect, provides a macro effect to monsters sent from hand or deck to grave, and if sent to grave, searches a ritual monster or spell, being experimented with for its field effects for now. Dark Rebellion Exceeds Dragon was a rank 4 that could detach two materials to seal half the attack of an opponent's monster permanently, seeing staple play in various rank 4 strategies. Oasis of Dragon Souls was a continuous trap that effectively acted as a Call of the Haunted that summoned in defense mode and made the summoned monster a worm, seeing play in Satellar Knight for being copies 4, 5, and 6 of Call. Solemn Scolding was a counter trap that operated just like Solemn Judgment with the condition of paying 3,000 and having to be the only card set to activate, seeing some experimentation thanks to the power of that effect. Fusion Substitute was a TCG exclusive whose names always treated as polymerization, can only fuse using materials on the field, and can be banished engraved to return a fusion engraved to the extra deck and draw one, seeing some experimentation as a polymerization substitute for some strategies in the short term, but eventually finding a home as a combo piece a few years from now. Lastly, number 39, Utopia Beyond, was a rank 6 that could drop all opponent's monsters to zero attack on Exceed Summon, and could detach a material to banish and exceed you control and revive a Utopia monster and gain 1250 life points, seeing play in rank 6 strategies for its summon effect. Following two weeks later would be the Noble Knights of the Round Table box set, which would bring a couple of new cards to the Noble Knight strategy in Merlin, Bedvere, and Last Chapter, but none of these would do anything to push Noble Knights into the meta, though would provide reprints of various cards in an exclusive platinum rarity that would never be used again after this, with reprints of Honest, Valor, Dark Hole, MST, Rhoda, Book of Moon, Foolish Burial, Gold Sark, Forbidden Lance, Call of the Haunted, Deep Prison, Warning, Torrential, and Compulse. YCS Anaheim would take place three days after this on November 24th, being the final top 16 sealed event of the year. And though the Duelist Alliance decks would once again take large chunks of representation in the top 32, Clifford had rapidly risen to second place in representation, utilizing stun tools to take advantage of the Clifford summon conditions, but also using Trampolinks, who could provide the low scale for Pendulum Summoning using Scout, then bounce the Scout with its scale effect to allow another Clifford search in the same turn thanks to Scout being a soft once per turn. Patrick Hoban would win the event in the draft top cut, piloting to top 16 using Burning Abyss, who did not publish his decklist from this event, marking his second YCS win and third major event win overall following Toronto this year and the NAWCQ the previous year. YCS Milan would be held two weeks later, and with the adjustments from the new challengers, Satellar Knight had completely fallen out of the top 32, with Evil Swarm taking a single top spot and the rest being split between BA, Shadal, and Clifford. Danielle Stella would take the event on Clifford, playing the standard Clifford lines as well as the now staple Trample Links for his build. YCS Sydney 2 would be the following weekend on December 14th, and would be the final YCS of the year, but unfortunately very little is known about this event due to the loss of data from the official Yu-Gi-Oh! website changeover, causing us to not know any of the top 32 from this event. Peter Mitro would take the event on Shadal, using both Denko Seka and the artifacts to provide the lights for Construct Summon. And this would mark an end to the events of 2014 in the history of the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game, with the meta fairly stable between Shadal, Burning Abyss, and Clifforts, and changes on the horizon. As the game was not content with simply revolutionizing fusion and tribute summons, there was another summoning method on the table to be revolutionized moving into 2015, and this would do far more than just revolutionize, it was going to break the game yet again. Again. A huge shout out to my Dark Law level patrons, Dammit Marco, Heyo, Jukes, McJaga, Otaku GamerX, Prinrin, Ryza339, and Takamine Fujiwara, as well as all of my other patrons over on Patreon.com. If you'd like to support the channel, consider following me on Patreon, where support tiers start at as little as $1 and you get access to all my videos a day early. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe to the channel, that way you don't miss out on any future videos. Every subscription helps out more than you think. Thank you all again, and I'll see you next time.